You know, when I was in, uh, in my teenage years, I remember the first time I drove in downtown Billings. You talk about an experience, all those one-way signs, right? And I'm a teenager and I've got the music cranked up. I'm playing my Top Gun soundtrack. And the song that was on was Danger Zone. Kenny Loggins, you know the song I'm talking about? Highway to, I'm Tom Cruise, that's what I'm thinking in my mind. And I'm growing down highway to the danger zone. And that's, that's what I'm thinking. And, but there were some key differences. One of those is I was in a baby blue Ford Escort, not a motorcycle. <laughs> Windows were rolled down and the tunes were playing from my cassette player, just saying. And the other key difference was I, I, uh, I, missed, a, I missed a sign. Uh, well, a sign that looks kind of like this. And uh, I, took, I, t I took whatever that is, a right-hand turn, left-hand turn. I just went the wrong way down a one-way. You know what I mean? You talk about a danger zone. All of a sudden, I see all these headlights coming my way. Has that ever happened to anybody else? You've gone the wrong way down a one-way? I'm not talking about the baby blue Ford Escort and Kenny Loggins song, but the wrong way down a one-way? Yeah, put up your hand with pride. Join me in this, would you? It's scary, isn't it? You talk about some anxiety. You talk about a troubled heart. Today in the scriptures, what we're going to see is, well, Jesus is the one way. He is the one way to treat a troubled heart. That's what we're going to talk about. So follow along if you would. I'm going to read the first six verses of John chapter 14. Here we go. Begins with words in red. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? <laughs> Jesus answered, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Oh, Lord, thanks for your word. Jesus, thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Would you watch over this time, Holy Spirit? We ask that you transform us. You meet us where we're at, but you don't want us to stay there. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. Thanks for laying down your life. This is your church. We submit to you. Speak to us. Your servants are listening. And I pray this in the mighty name of the King we serve, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, before we, before we talk about how Jesus is the one way to treat a troubled heart, I want to build a little context. And I want to do that by looking at chapter 13, verse 1. And here's what it says. Because this really builds and helps us understand the place and the time and what was happening. Verse 1 in chapter 13 says, It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. You see, at this point, Jesus' public ministry has ended. The hour for him had come. The gathering that's taken place, taking place right here is a private setting. It's a very intimate time. He's there with his disciples for one final meal before his crucifixion. And the dialogue he's having with them, this discourse that he's having with them is known as the upper room discourse because it takes place in the upper room. The upper room of an unnamed house belonging to an unnamed person. That's the setting. Think about that. This all-important conversation that takes place with Jesus and his disciples shortly before he dies is in somebody's house that we don't even know anything about the house or the person. And this discourse that Jesus is having, it's the longest one recorded in the Gospels because it begins in John chapter 13 and goes all the way to the end of John chapter 17. And one of the things you may have noticed as we've talked about these I am statements in John that Jesus makes is that it seems like every one of them is connected or around very close to some kind of a Jewish festival. Today is no exception. We see in verse 1 there of chapter 13 that the, the Jewish festival of the Passover is taking place. This is a time that they remember and celebrate their exodus from the land of Egypt. And God himself led his people by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. So it's a time for them to look back and rejoice and celebrate what had happened in the past, but it's also pointing forward to what's about to happen in just a few short hours from this. 
because God once again would deliver his people and he would do it through the person of Jesus Christ who is God himself. And he didn't do it by a pillar of fire or by a pillar of cloud, but he did it by way of the cross. And he delivered, he delivered sinful men held captive by sin. He delivered us from the wages of sin and death. That's what's happening here. God's timing is perfect. This is at the Jewish Passover festival. His plan will not be thwarted. That alone should be a faith builder for all of us. And Jesus at this point had made it very clear to his disciples. They knew with clarity at this point that he soon would die. So they're upset. They're upset. And I want to mention a couple other things that's happening here in chapter 13 right before what we're going to study. First, the betrayer of Jesus has been exposed. We know his name to be Judas. And verse 30 of chapter 13 says that Judas left the group. He's gone. He left. And then right after that, Jesus has a little conversation with Peter. And he informs Peter that by the time the rooster crows the next day, he will have denied Jesus three times. Naturally, the disciples are going to be upset. They're distraught. They're anxious. Their hearts are troubled. Jesus is about to die. The betrayer of Jesus has been exposed. And their leader, Peter, is going to deny Jesus three times in the next 24 hours. That's what's happening. Then we get to verse 1 of chapter 14. And this is what Jesus tells his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. This is a statement, at least a portion of a verse that we oftentimes hear at a funeral. And it's an appropriate place to mention this for sure. But we need to also keep in mind that Jesus is saying this to his disciples to comfort them in a time where they are emotionally fragile. Because they view everything that's happened and about to happen as a catastrophic failure. So Jesus comforts them. Think about this though. If there was ever a time for the disciples to come alongside Jesus to support him and comfort him, now would be the time. But instead he comforts and supports them because he loves them to the end. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. There's one thing I want to point out about that statement that Jesus makes there in the beginning of verse 1. It's a command. It's an imperative command because... They and we have a choice. We can choose to allow our hearts to be troubled or we can choose to not allow them to be troubled. What's the very first thing the angel said to the shepherds when Jesus was born? What, is, what proclamation did the angel say to the shepherds? Do not be afraid. Do not fear. It's really the same thing that Jesus is saying shortly before his death. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And he doesn't just end there. He doesn't say, get over it. Suck it up, buttercup. Don't be stressed out. No. He gives a reason. He gives a solution on how they can treat a troubled heart. Because there, in the second half of verse 1, you can see it in your Bibles. Check it out. He says, you believe in God. Believe also in me. You want to know what the anecdote for anxiety is? It's an act of faith. Trusting in Jesus. The anecdote for anxiety is having an act of faith. It's abiding in Christ. It's what we've been talking about the last several weeks. As a matter of fact, Jesus, the last thing he says in this upper room discourse before he prays for the disciples in chapter 17, at the end of chapter 16, verse 33, he says this to them, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In me, you may have peace because in this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart because I've overcome this world. In this world, we're going to have trouble and we do. But in him, we can have peace because he's overcome the world. So take heart. Jesus saying, trust me. Tr trust me. Believe in me. Believe. Believe. Believe, it's a word we see all over the scriptures. In the New Testament alone, we see it 241 times, and it's certainly a central aspect. It's a central word to the Gospel of John because of those 241 times in the New Testament, we find that it's used 100 of those times in John alone, believe. We've talked about this before, but that word believe is the Greek word pisteo, and it means to completely put your, put your life, put your trust completely, entirely puts your life into the hands of somebody else. That's what it looks like to believe in Jesus Christ. 
That's how you deal with a troubled heart. Let me sum it up this way. You should see this statement in bold at the top of your worship guide, but here's how I wanna sum all of this up. To treat a troubled heart, trust Jesus. To treat a troubled heart, trust Jesus because he is the one way. I think it's a reminder. It maybe sounds simple, but it's a reminder I think every single one of us needs. I know I need it because I find that Paul McClintock's heart can go to a place of being troubled pretty quickly, full of fear, full of worry, full of anxiety. And more often than I want to admit, I try to deal with it on my own strength, deal with it on my own way instead of taking it to Jesus Christ in prayer and trusting him with it. I need this reminder from Jesus. I do. How about you? You here with a troubled heart today? Dealing with heavy stuff? Troubled heart? Perhaps something you're facing, an illness, a relationship issue? (laughs) Maybe just turn on the news. There's lots of things in this world that can lead to troubled hearts. Maybe there's something that's causing you to be anxious and not in your stomach leading to sleepless nights. There's lots of ways we can try to trust in other things, other people, ourselves. We can trust in stuff, money stuff, things, or ourselves in order to deal with it, but there's only one way, one way to deal with it, to treat a troubled heart, and it's trusting in Jesus Christ. It's trusting in him. And this is what's so amazing. Jesus doesn't just stop there. He actually goes on, and we're going to see this in the next couple verses. He gives us three reasons why we should believe, why we can trust him. And all three of those reasons, they deal with a place. They deal with a place. I mean, look at verse 2. It's what Jesus says. My father's house has many rooms. He's talking about a place, his father's house, a new Jerusalem, a new dwelling place, a heavenly dwelling place, the heavenly kingdom. That's what Jesus is talking about. And I think it's easy when we see a statement like this for us in our cultural mindset to think, oh, this is going to be pretty good. I'm going to have me a mansion in heaven next to the Stillwater River with elk running through the backyard, right? (laughs) I don't think that's the point Jesus is making. Now, don't get me wrong, I believe our rooms, our homes in heaven are going to be more stupendous than we can even imagine here on this earth. And I also also kind of tend to believe, now that's just me a little bit, I think some people are going to have bigger houses or some people are going to have mansions in heaven. You know who those people are? They're going to be the ones who volunteer in the nursery because you get a mansion if you take care of babies, just saying. And let me say this too. Oh, we need some volunteers in the nursery. So if, you're, if you can hold a baby, change a diaper, you ought to fill out a connect card. I'm not joking. Go see Angela Grimes, our early childhood development coordinator, because she'll help you on your way to getting a mansion in heaven. <laughs> anyway. The ultimate point Jesus is making here is that his father's house has many, many, many rooms. Many rooms. It's interesting that word room, rooms, in the Greek language is the word monet. We only see it in two places in the scriptures. Here and in verse 23, we'll see it just a little bit later too. Monet. And that word actually shares the root word in Greek for the word apostle. The title of our sermon series. You see, the point Jesus is making is this is a place where we abide, a place where we dwell, a dwelling place. Some translations actually say dwelling place instead of rooms. Maybe you're familiar with that. Our Father's house is a place. (laughs) It's a place for many, many, many people because there's many, many places to abide. There's lots and lots of room in our Father's house. I just got to tell you, when I saw that and when I thought about that statement, it took me back to a place when I was in youth group. And I used to even help lead this song at Beartooth Christian Camp about our father's house being a big old house. And I thought, I got an opportunity. John's never going to let me lead worship here. We've talked about this, but I'm going to do it right now because we're going to sing about our father's house and how it has lots and lots of room. We're going to have the words on the screen. And if you know how this goes, I get to lead this once again, like we're at Beartooth Christian Camp. So sing along with me. Here we go. Come and go with me to my father's house. It's a big, big house with lots and lots of room. A big, big table with lots and lots of food. There's a big, big yard where we can play football. It's a big, big house. It's my father's house. Woo! 
You can see why John doesn't have me help with worship ever. I thought that was fun. At least it was fun, fun for me. But did you know that the Bible actually does talk about how large and how big our father's house is? Oh, yeah, it does. John got a sneak peek And he saw the new Jerusalem. He saw the heavenly kingdom. He saw our rooms. He saw the Father's house. This is recorded in Revelation 21. Check it out on your own if you'd like. And some of the things that's said about this house is it's lit up by the glory of God. Its brilliance is clear as crystal. The city itself is of pure gold, as pure as glass. Sounding pretty good yet? John also sees an angel appear. And the angel takes a measurement. It turns out that this dwelling place is actually a massive cube. And on every side, the measurement comes out to 12,000 stadia. I had to do a little research on that because that's talked about in John uh, Revelation 21, 16. I did a little research on 12,000 stadia, and that works out to this area. It's a surface area of about 1,400 miles. That's just on the surface area. Hang in there with me on this because I was kind of nerding out a little bit, having a little fun. That's just surface area. you got to cube that in order to get the total dimensions, and when you do, that comes out to 2 million square miles. That's 15,000 times the size of London, England. And if that doesn't help, because that didn't help me a whole lot, it's about the size of the moon. Yeah, but in a cube shape. It's big. It's big. Now, I also found this and thought it was kind of interesting. Scientist Henry Morris said that according to his calculations, about 20, 20, 20, 20 billion people can reside there, each having a cubicle block with 75 acres on every side. Picture this. It's cool, isn't it? And that would only take up about 25% of the total area. It big. That's just our father's house. We're not even talking about the new earth yet. I can't wait to just get up there and explore it. You know what I mean? I can't wait to explore it. That's what awaits us as Christians. Let that encourage your troubled heart today. Let that encourage your troubled heart today. Here it is. Let me sum it up this way. Our father's house. Our father's house has plenty of room. That's the first point in your worship guide. What I'd ask you to do is take out a pen, if you would, seat pocket in front of you, and next to that line, would you draw a simple little house? It can be a little cube, a little block with a few windows in there. Draw that as a reminder that Jesus is the one way. We can trust Jesus because he is the one way to our Father's house, to his Father's house, and it's got plenty of room. You don't have to be an artist to do this. I could even do it. Little box. Do that as a reminder that Jesus is the one way to a place with plenty of room. Of course, you know that place is going to be a great place. It's going to be good because the GC, and GC for you non-construction people, that means general contractor. Yeah, I'm really not construction either, but I'm just kind of, feeling pretty cool right now. But GC of this place is JC himself, Jesus Christ himself. Because the second half of verse two, Jesus says this, if that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Now we have to ask a question right now. What's that mean? What is Jesus talking about? What's it mean that he's going there to prepare a place for us? What's he mean by that? Does that mean that for the last 2,000 years, every, every morning, Jesus is waking up at 8 a.m., putting a tool belt around his waist, and he's been building these, this house, this, his father's house, these rooms for us for the last 2,000 years? No, it doesn't mean that. Fun to think that would be. I don't think that's the case. Or, or does it mean that every time a sinner repents and begins to follow Jesus, he puts on the tool belt and begins to build a room for them? No, I don't think it means that either. We know the angels in, hell, in heaven celebrate but it doesn't mean that Jesus begins a building project each time that happens. We know that to be true because Jesus says himself in Matthew 25, verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, and here it is, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. The father's house, the heavenly kingdom, our rooms have been prepared since the creation of the world. And I suspect Jesus built them not with a hammer, but through a spoken word. 
Just like he spoke and the entire cosmos came into existence. And so then, what does it mean? What is Jesus saying? That he went and prepared a place for us. What's he talking about? He's pointing to the cross. Our access into our fathers, his father's heavenly home. It was necessary for him to endure the cross. That's what he's talking about. He prepared the way for us to go there by way of the cross. Think of it this way. Those rooms in heaven, they don't say under construction on them. Uh, the doors aren't closed with a sign that says under construction. No, the doors have been opened through the crucifixion. Not, not under construction, but it's been done through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That's how he prepared the way. That's how he opened the doors. And he did that for you and me. Let your heart be encouraged by that today. I would also encourage you now to draw a, a picture of a cross. There in your worship guide, that should be pretty easy for you. There in the second point. Reminding all of us, we can trust Jesus. He is the one way to a place that's been prepared by him for you and for me. If you would do that in your worship guide, that'd be great. You know, as I thought about this point, I thought about the birth of our Lord. God himself, who created all things, spoke it into existence, the King of kings put on skin and he dwelt among us. And while he was just a little baby in Mary's womb, Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem. And what was the message that they heard? There's no room. We don't have any rooms here. There's no space. There's no place for you in the inn. So the one who spoke all things into creation, the creator of this world that he came into, there was no room for him, so he was born in a manger among the animals. This world had no room for him, but he died on the cross to make room for us. That's the kind of king I want to follow. And he's coming back to take all, to take all who follow him to be with him forever. Verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. The best part about this place that's got plenty of room that's been prepared by Jesus is that we get to be with the King of Kings for all of eternity. Let that encourage your troubled hearts today. Final thing I'd ask you to draw there next to that third point is just draw a simple crown as a reminder that we can trust Jesus because he is the one way to go to a place where we are in his presence. Draw a little crown there at the bottom, if you would. And if we're in Jesus' presence, that also means we're going to be in the presence of the Father. Because Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in him. That's what Jesus goes on to talk about in verses 7 through 11. And oh, I wanted to unpack those verses today, but we just don't have time. But Jesus makes this point, he drives this point home, and it's quite clear in verse 11 because this is what he says, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. This is known as the doctrine. Doctrine meaning teaching. This is the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus mentions the Holy Spirit just a few verses later in verse 17. Three distinct persons, one in nature, one in essence, who are in one another and who make up one Godhead. Got it? <laughs> yeah, me neither. Confused? A little bit. Hard to get our minds around it. There's some mystery there. But just because we can't fully comprehend it in our finite minds because God is infinite doesn't make it less true. It's what we believe because it's what the Bible teaches. 
And Jesus himself said, believe in me. I am in the Father. The Father is in me. It's Jesus' words. So astounding are these claims that we see Jesus make throughout the Gospel of John with all these I am statements. So astounding are they that if they weren't true, he'd be a raving lunatic. If they weren't true, he wouldn't be just a good man because no good man would make those kind of false claims. The one thing we can't miss as we study these I am statements in the Gospel of John is that Jesus Christ is God himself. We can't leave our study and miss that he's not created being. He's been there from the beginning. Before the beginning, he's always been in existence. Colossians 2.9, the Apostle Paul says this, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lies in bodily form. He is God. He is God. And he is the great I am. He is the great I am. In any teaching out there that reduces Jesus to anything less than God himself, it's wrong, it's heretical, it's unbiblical, and I believe it's demonic. Run from it because it'll take you the wrong way. The other thing I want to mention about the doctrine of the Trinity is that many theologians believe, and I tend to agree with this statement, they believe that this relationship within the triune Godhead between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sets the very stage, is the very origin for human community. It's why we as humans have this desire to be in relationship with one another. People do. And relationship with God. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 actually says that God wrote eternity on the hearts of people. So I believe, and I know it to be true because the Bible says it, that all people, whether they want to admit it or not, all people, because eternity is written on our hearts, all people have that desire to go back to the place we were created to be in, in the Garden of Eden, to be in relationship, to be in community with God. may not want to admit it, but it's written on all people's hearts. And there's only one way into the presence of God, and it's Jesus Christ. The way to a person is through a person, the person of Jesus Christ, because he is God. No other religion in the entire world makes those kind of claims, only Christianity, because only Christianity is true. Now, some may say, well, Paul, this is all good. Trust Jesus. He's the one way to a place, a father's house, a place with plenty of room, prepared by him, be in his presence, the three Ps. That's great. But I'm dealing with trouble today, Paul. I'm, I'm, I'm suffering today. There's hardships in my life today. What about that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because in verse 23 of this very same chapter, here's what our Lord says. Anyone who loves me will be, obey my teaching. True belief, true faith, a saving faith will result in a changed life and obeying Jesus. Then Jesus goes on to say, my father will love them and here it is. We will come to them and make our home with them. You see what Jesus is saying here, the moment that a believer has a saving faith, a true faith, Jesus says that we, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit will go and make our home with them. That's Monet, abide, dwell in us. Jesus had to go the way and prepare the way by going the way of the cross. And because he did, he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. So for Christians today, we have the very spirit of the living God inside of us. That, my friends, is called power. There's power in prayer, is there not? There's power in prayer. Let that encourage your troubled hearts today. Not only is this a future reality, this is a reality in our lives today, being in the presence of God because of what Jesus has done. He's the one way. Well, after Jesus describes this way and this place, after he says this in the first three verses to his disciples, he says in verse 4, you know the way to the place where I'm going. It's almost like he's reassuring them that you do indeed know the way because you know me. But they haven't grasped, they haven't gotten a grip, they haven't fully uh, taken a hold of what Jesus is saying. And so Thomas, he kind of raises his hand right now. I mean, that's how I can picture this happening. And I know Thomas gets a bad rap, you know, doubting Thomas, all that kind of stuff. He gets a bit of a bad rap, but I got to applaud him here because he's demonstrating some courage and he's, and he's asking the question that everybody has. All the disciples have this question. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Let me ask you something. 
You remember a time that maybe you were in a, I don't know, a classroom setting, college, something like that. You were being taught, and you're there, and you have no clue what is happening. This, happened, this happens a lot with me. You don't know what the professor's talking about. You don't understand. You just don't get it. And you feel like you're all alone. And then suddenly, there's that person from the other side of the room. They raise their hand. And they say, teacher, teacher, professor, I don't get it. I'm lost. And you're just like, thank you. I'm not alone on this. And then the whole room, you know, chimes in and everybody's lost. I kind of think that's what's happening right here. They don't get it. So Thomas raises his hand. And he says, Lord... We don't know the way. We, we, don't, we don't know the way. And so Jesus makes it clear with his six I am statement in John 14, 6, he says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the one way. He alone is the way to God because he alone is the truth about God. This is good news. Because in this world, it's pretty hard. It seems like it's increasingly getting harder and harder to know what is true and what is not true, doesn't it? What to believe in, what not to believe in. We can trust Jesus Christ because he embodies the very truth and that truth is expressed through his word, God's word, the scriptures. Jesus is the only way. We can trust him as the only way to God because he is also the very life of God. And he offers that Zoe abundant eternal life to us through his spirit. I mean, obviously the disciples, they couldn't fully comprehend. They didn't understand. They didn't know what was going on. At least at this point, they didn't. Just a few hours from that time, Jesus would be crucified. The one who said, I am the way, would go the way of the cross. The one who said, I am the truth, would be nailed to the cross by people blaspheming in his name and lying about him. The one who said, I am the life, his lifeless body would be placed into the tomb. It's no wonder Peter denied him. It's no wonder all the disciples scattered and went into hiding. I think I would have too. <laughs> that was. That was until three days from that time. Through the power of God the Father, Jesus rose from the grave. The resurrection changes everything because it happened, because it's true. You know, all 11 disciples, I say 11 because at this point Judas is gone, he's out of the picture. All 11 disciples went to their graves proclaiming that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messiah. He's Lord, he's King, he's the great I am, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that message through the work of the Holy Spirit, it spread like wildfire and the church of Jesus Christ was born. And that message still impacts the world we live in today. Oh, let that encourage your troubled hearts. I want to show a little video as we wrap up. I think it's also going to encourage your troubled hearts. I mentioned a few weeks ago that Janet, the kids and I, we enjoyed watching the Summer Olympics. The games part. And... Uh, there's a young lady, 16 years old, Raisa Leal from Brazil, and she used her world stage platform to send a message. Check this out. language I don't but what she signed there you could see they referenced it there in the script on the bottom when a lot of the skateboarders the other athletes were you know doing peace signs heart signs whatever in sign language she said that Jesus is the way the truth and the life every single one of us has a platform May not be on the world stage like this Olympic athlete, but every one of us were surrounded by 21st century Thomases and they're asking the same question. How do I know the way? They're in our classrooms, they're in our churches, they're in our families. 
They're our next door neighbor. They may not be raising their hand. They may not be saying it out loud, but the heart of the human condition that we have been born into is we're all, they're all wondering how do we know the way? And as Christians, we know the way we have the answer and his name is Jesus Christ. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the one way to our Father's house. A place with plenty of room for all those who will believe, including our neighbors, including all those Thomases out there. And it's a place that he's prepared for us. And it's a place where we'll be in his presence. That's not just a future reality, but that's a reality for us today. Let that encourage your troubled hearts. Let's pray. If you're here today and... I just got to say, if you've been going your own way, no matter how far you've gone the wrong way, God's grace is available for you. Hey, maybe you're here and Jesus is calling you into a relationship with himself. And you've never accepted him, began that relationship. There's only two places we can go. And you've got a choice to make. Respond to him. And go to a place... <laughs> It's got plenty of room. It's been prepared by him and it's in his presence. You're ready to begin a relationship with Jesus today. I just, you can begin that with a conversation. That's how relationships start. Just say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Tell him you're sorry for your sin. Tell him you're sorry for going your own way and you're ready to go his way. Tell him you're sorry, you repent of your sin and you're ready to follow him. You just tell him that right now. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Then thank him for being that substitute. He's the one who had to prepare the way and open the door. He did it through the cross. Say, thank you, Jesus, for going the way of the cross for me. And then finally, you can just tell him right where you're at, eyes closed, heads bowed. Just say, Jesus, I'm ready to surrender to you as king because that's who he is. And if you prayed that today, Welcome to the family. Welcome to the journey. Welcome to the adventure of following Jesus. I'd love to know. I'd love to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But with all heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed and began a relationship with Jesus today, would you just slip up your hand and make eye contact with me? I believe there's some in the room that God's calling into a relationship with him today, maybe online. Just put it up. Keep it up for just a moment so I can see you. Make sure you I see you in the back. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? God, thank you that you are in the business of transforming the hearts and minds of men. Thank you, Jesus, for making the way because you are the way. You're good. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen.